let's just get started and uh, we'll see what happens. I, um, I didn't get this till about, uh, oh, I'd say about three o'clock this morning. So. It kind of divides into two paths, and so I just need to know which one to go with. So I think if we just get started, let the Holy Ghost lead us. Uh, let's go to Mark, the 11th chapter. Now I know what you're thinking. Apostle David preaching on faith. Pastor Andy's going to preach on faith. Well, I might and I might not. We'll just have to see. Uh We'll start reading in the um, 11th chapter. We'll start reading in the 9th verse. Not that it, uh, I just want to give you context for what's going on here. In verse 9 it says, And they went before him. Whoever they were, they were people that uh, uh, recognized that Jesus was the Messiah, he was the king, and they went before him, and they that followed cried, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord, blessed be the kingdom of our father David, that cometh in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Now these are the people that were coming behind David, or behind Jesus, and they were saying all this stuff. Well, I heard a man say one time, he was a psychologist, is a psychologist. He said a friend, a true friend is somebody that will, when you have a hardship in your life, you can tell them and they won't try to one-up you. Yeah. They'll just listen. Yeah. And, when, and, and uh, the other characteristic is that when you tell them uh, something's going good in your life, they'll rejoice with you and they'll be happy for you, genuinely happy for you. If those people, if you don't have that, I'm talking about people that fake it. I'm talking about the, uh, those that uh, mourn with those that mourn and rejoice with them that rejoice. It doesn't mean they're bad people. It doesn't mean they're going to hell. It just means that for that particular time, you do not want to be rejoicing with somebody that mourns. Especially when you're rejoicing over something that you should be mourning about. The world's mourning over this and you're rejoicing because you see something the world doesn't see. See, the world doesn't see what the people of God see. So, in the 11th verse, and Jesus entering into Jerusalem, into the temple, he w went, looked around upon all things, and the eventide was come. He went out into Bethany with the 12. He had his posse. I've been thinking about getting me a posse to wrap, dry, uh, ride around with. It makes me feel safer. <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you something. I got, I got a new definition for a prophet because Jesus was the prophet. I mean, we got many prophets, but he was the prophet. And looking at Jesus' life, this is what I've decided a prophet is. A prophet is the wrong person saying the wrong thing to the wrong people in front of the wrong people. <laughs> and they try to kill him. Anybody want to sign up for prophet? Didn't think so. So, here's Jesus, and on, in verse 12, he says, On the morrow when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. You know, there's very few uh, times in Scripture that we get any kind of inkling of any kind of need that Jesus has. But on this day, he was hungry. Does anybody think, can think of any other time in the Word where it says it, except for like in the wilderness, uh, that the Bible says that he was hungry or thirsty or lonely or 
But he was just walking along. He'd been ministering, and he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves, which means if it's got leaves, it's going to be fruiting. It's he came if happily. I love, I love King James. I'm reading from King James. Happily. Like, like Jesus saw this fig tree. He's happy. No, no, it doesn't mean that. It means like, and maybe it might, it, just in case that there were to happen to be some figs on there. But I just think it's funny. Happily. I can just see Jesus skipping. Gonna <laughs> give me some figs. <laughs> yeah. If happily he might find anything thereon, and when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. For the time of figs was not yet. And Jesus answered and said unto it, Jesus talked to a fig tree. Now don't tell me that, that, that that's weird because uh, when the vacuum cleaner doesn't work, When you, go, when you go to the sink and you turn it and it sprays at your face, don't tell me you don't talk to it. You talk to it. When your kids ain't acting right, wait a minute, hold on. I know that not because I have kids, but because I was a kid. I mean, you know, these, these people that talk about, well, how can you teach me about parenting or being this or being that? You never had kids. Jesus didn't either. As a matter of fact, now all you teenage girls cover your ears. Mary was an unmed, well, unwed mother. She got pregnant out of wedlock. And she was the mother of Jesus. As a man, you say around here, all you mothers. I'm just telling you what somebody else said. I don't know if you've ever read the Bible, but there's some messed up stuff that goes on in the Bible. I mean, you got incest, you got all kind of stuff going on in the Bible. You got men married to more than one woman. You're asking for trouble. You take, let's just say you take five women. Five good, godly women. And give them one husband. You got war. Uh huh. Yeah, as a matter of fact, there was a guy that was a uh, uh, um, he was a salesman, and he said, "Well, listen, I got this. I've got this place you can come to, and you can get your husband. I mean, we've got we've got all kind of husbands." And so the lady said, "Well, I'm just, I'm just gonna see what they got over there." So she went to the to the thing, and on the first floor, it said, uh, "He's got a job." Oh wow, he's got a job. Well, how about that? Hallelujah. He's got a job. She said, well, I'm not going to stop at the first floor. Let's see what they got on the second floor. You get to the second floor. He's got a job, and he's good looking, easy to look at. He's not difficult to look at. I mean, <laughs> you know, some people so easy, it's so, so ugly, they snag lightning. <laughs> and this one will grab you and say, ooh. What's his name? That's on the second floor. Uh, she says, well, you know, that's good. That's good. I want to see what they got on the third floor. So she gets to the third floor. He's, uh, he's uh, got a job. He's nice looking. And he does, he likes uh, doing work at the house. He likes washing dishes and all that kind of stuff. That's on the third floor. No, we just got to the third floor, sweetie. To the third floor. 
She gets to the third floor. She says, man, this is great. This is awesome. So she said, well, I'm going to go on up. I'm going up. I'm going up. She gets to the fourth floor. He's uh, got a job. It's nice looking. Likes to do uh, chores at the house. And he likes to be romantic. I'm talking about, man, when you come home, there's flower petals from the door to the table where he's already got you a, something to eat. I mean, yeah, praise him. Give him glory. Give him glory. She says, man, this is awesome. This is great. This is wonderful. She says, I got to see what's on it. She goes to the fifth floor. And on the fifth floor, it says, the sign, the sign says, there are no men up here. This just proves that women are impossible to please. <laughs> Bad Pastor Andy. Bad Pastor Andy. <laughs> It was a man that said that. <laughs> oh, Lord, what were we at for? We got off on that. Hey, hallelujah. So here we go. Jesus, he's, he comes up to this fig tree. He says, no man eat fruit of you uh, from here on after. And his disciples heard it. Now, this alludes back to faith, and I'm just giving you Basically, what I'm doing, because I, I know Apostle David, when he, he's going to preach Mark 11, 23 and 24, and I'm not competing with him. I've already got to p compete with my wife. I don't want to compete with Apostle David. So he comes in. He says, the fig tree, uh, he, he cursed the fig tree from the roots and just goes about his business. Now, think about this in the, uh, the, in the uh, ideology of faith. You know, Jesus didn't feel that the fig tree had dried up. He couldn't see that the fig tree had dried up. See, there's some things that, you can, that, that, that are bad things in your life, and you can speak to them, and just because it doesn't happen in a couple of days doesn't mean. God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. His word endures forever. You can't destroy his word. If he said it, he watches over his word to perform it. If you've got a word from God, you better stand on that word because I can tell you this, the thief cometh but to kill, to steal, kill, and destroy. He's coming for the word. And it doesn't matter to him if you live or not. He does, it's not all about you. It's about the word. He's coming for the word. So that's what he's coming for. So here he is. He curses the fig tree, and they came out of Jerusalem, and Jesus went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. Now, <laughs> think about this. Little old sweet Jesus. He never hurt nobody. He never hurt nobody. He overthrew the tables. Get out of him. What do y'all do? Jesus. I'm sure it was more dramatic than that. Because in one, verse, uh, 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 one translation, it says he braided a whip. He threw the tables over and whipped them. When's the last time you went to the supermarket and said, I don't like the prices? Threw the tables over and started whipping people. He was mad. Jesus got mad. Why did he get mad? And when evening was come, he went out to the city. Let's see. Um, the, um, okay, all right. Uh, back up to 17th verse. And he taught, saying unto them, is it not written? He didn't just do that. He taught them why he did it. This is why he did it. 
This is why he did what he did. See, some people get mad, and they have no idea why they get mad. You know, Vicki's been teaching on Wednesday nights about the source when she's talking about Ruth and uh, uh, the, uh, the entanglements and, and the things that you get entangled. Go find out what the source is. What is the source? Where did it come from? You could have heard something on the evening news and just got mad and went out and treated somebody wrong just because you heard something on the evening news. That's not God. That's got nothing to do with God. That's just got something to do with you uh, getting mad about something that somebody said that you don't even, you can't even prove is true or you, you wasn't even involved in it. You don't even know what happened. And now you just as angry as you can be because somebody told you that somebody that didn't like you because of the color of your skin, because of the, your religious belief, because of uh, your uh, uh, political affiliation. You can't listen to that. As a matter of fact, there's a verse that says no. Let's see, what is it, Vic? It's the one, uh, no man uh, uh, warfare uh, entangles himself with the affairs of this world. But y'all get the gist, right? No man going to battle entangles himself with the affairs of this world. We got a battle to fight, and it ain't what Fox News, CBN, CNN, or whoever, that's not what they're telling us it is. As a matter of fact, if you go to pray, and you're praying about what you're hearing on the news, you're, pray, you're praying the devil's prayer. Because you're just praying about stuff everybody knows about. But when you are a watchman on the wall, when you take your place in the spirit, as a matter of fact, it gets on down here, is that when you stand praying, it doesn't mean that you physically stand up even though you can. Now look, it ain't that bad. When... Uh, when you stand, that's talking about a position of authority that you have in the spirit. And unless you know him, you're never going to understand your authority in the spirit. And so when you stand praying, understand. Understand that there's a position of authority that you hold in the spirit. Why is that? Why is that? Because, you know, in John 10, there's a scripture that says, that talks about, uh, uh, it was right after steal, kill, destroy, that great one that everybody likes to read and all that kind of stuff. But there's a one uh, on down there where they took up stones to stone Jesus. So they took the, uh, the Sadducees, Pharisees, whichever one you want to pick. You know how to tell the difference between Sadducees and Pharisees, right? Pharisees were fair. Because they believed in the miraculous and the supernatural. The Sadducees were sad, you see. <laughs> because they didn't believe in the supernatural and the miracles. Remember, it was the Sadducees that tried to get Jesus and try to say, uh, who's uh, uh, this woman doesn't have children. She's married to this brother. Yeah. Then got to carry on seed, carry on seed, carry on seed. It was the Sadducees that did that. But Jesus answered them in a way that only Jesus can. He said, have you not read that, that God is the Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and, and, and God is not the uh, God of the dead, but he's the God of the living? So he just, I mean, he just tore their doctrine all to pieces. He did the same thing in the 10th chapter when he, when he told uh, uh, those people that were wanting to stone him and trying to stone him, he said, have you not written? Have you not read in your law? It's in your law. It's in your law. Have you not read in your law where I said you were gods? Because what they were mad about is that he said that he was the son of God, and they were saying that that made him equal with God. And Jesus said, have you not read in your law? It's written in your law. I said you were gods. 
Well, the reference on that goes to Psalm 82, where it starts off as a very qu uh, quick psalm. He says, God sitteth in the congregation of the mighty, uh, Hebrew word El, which is the root word of Elohim. The second part of that verse says, he judges among the gods. So who said you were gods? He said it. I had nothing to do with it. But now before you get your head blowed up, he goes on and he says, in the rest of those verses, he says, I told you to do this, 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 and this, and you didn't do it. And he says, I said, at the end of that, at the end of those verses, he said, I said, you were God's. Referencing to another time that he said they were God's. You can't find that reference because there isn't one. Well, when did he say they were God's? You go back to John 10, he says, he talk, he's talking to them. He says, if God gave that to them whom, to whom the word of God was given, the word of God was given. What makes you God's? The word of God that he gave you. If you got no word, no. And even if you do have a word, that word is specific to you. You're not God over anybody else. You know, God is not God's name. In fact, if you go through all the names of God, Jehovah Shama, Jehovah Sidkenu, Jehovah this, Jehovah that, all that stuff, very little of that has to do with him. It's got all, everything to do with us and what he gave us. In other words, when he told Adam and Eve, he, he said, have dominion. He put them over his word. It's not that you're anything. It's that his word is everything. And when he makes you a steward over it, then he sets. Who made you mighty? He sits in the congregation of the mighty. How are they mighty? Because he gave them a word. That's why they're mighty. You know that it's imp uh, without faith it's impossible to please God. Without faith it's impossible to please God. The Bible never says without grace it's impossible to please God. But yet faith is what draws on and pulls grace. Because what you're looking for is grace. Ephesians, first or second chapter. For by grace are you saved. Faith didn't save you. For by grace are you saved through faith. Faith is what latched on to grace. And you didn't get faith because you're some great and wonderful person you got faith because God sent a preacher, a preacher to tell you about him and that was the way you, act, you believed and that's the way you, act, you, you accessed his grace. Well, if it's the same with salvation, it's the same with everything else. That's why he said, I said you were God's. I said. God said, I said you were God's. Which means if you are a person that is dealing with all types of circumstances in your life and you can't get rid of them, it's because you don't know who you are or you haven't heard his word. You get over here, it says have, have the faith of God, have faith in God, have the faith of God. How can you have the faith of God if you don't have the word of God? See, this thing all revolves around him. We just think it revolves around us because we got Jehovah Jireh, my provider, my provider, Jehovah Shalom, my peace, mine, my, 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 my. As a matter of fact, there's very little that you can give to God. But there is some things you can give to God. 
You can give your obedience. You can give your love. You can give your praise. You can give your worship. You can give him that. Just think about it this way. What do your kids have to give you? They got nothing to give the little babies. Got nothing to give you. But yet they'll go out there in your yard, get a little flower, pick it up. See, there we go, right there. The flower belonged to you anyway. It was your flower. And the child brings it to you. Well, how does it make you feel? That's how he feels. See, we've got to get out of this thing because uh, in certain moves of God, we, we've got in this place, we think God's, God's, God's putting something on us because we deserve it because we are not perfect. God loved you before you were perfect. I mean, I know some of you have arrived. Okay, at least one of you have arrived. And then you just wait till after service and we'll cast that thing out of you. That. But God's a loving God. And, 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 and there's very, he, is, he gives everything, all his names. All the names that we have for him are things that he gives us. He lavishes upon us. I mean, I don't know how many, Tanya, how many names are there? Well, you brought a picture in here with all the names on it. You didn't count. You didn't count. There's a bunch of them, aren't there? And every one of them have to do with what he does for us. None of them have anything to do with what we do for him. But yet there are some, some things we can give him. They started singing it this morning. Worship through your pain. Stop. Blaming God for what you're going through and start worshiping him because he didn't do it to begin with. And I'm not telling you to get down on yourself. Well, I made a bad decision. There is not a person on this planet that has not ever made a bad decision in a day. Most of the time, too. And if you get down to weeks, then we probably make 15 or 16. I'm being, I'm being on the light side. But if you concentrate on that, then the devil's going to say, God can't do this for you because you remember what you did. God just doesn't love you like he does everybody else. You go to pray in prayers like, God, God, why do you keep putting this on to me? Why do you keep doing this to me? I, I mean, I've gone through so much, and you just hear this voice from out of nowhere. Well, I'm just going to be honest with you. I just don't like you that much. You ain't never heard God say that. Listen, he gave his only begotten son. His only so that he could have us. His only begotten son. He only had one. Oh, God's got everything. No, he only had one son. How many has he got now? Uncountable. Why? Because he didn't hold on to the one he had. He gave it and he sowed it. So anyway, let's keep, let's keep reading here. We're not going to get to where I was going, but hopefully I'll get you to a place that we can at least have a sermon. All right. So he kicked them all out. And the scribes and the chief priests heard it and saw how they might destroy him because they were jealous of him. Let's just get honest. They were mad because he had a, he had a relationship with God that they didn't have. There are people like that. Naomi was that way. Naomi had a relationship with God through everybody else. El, what is his name? El, El, El Emelech. El Emelech which means my God is king. She had a relationship with God through him. She didn't have to do it on her own. Somebody else did it. And then she loses all that, and then she gets mad and says, God has dealt bitterly with me. Except Ruth came along. And Ruth met the king. 
Boaz is Jesus. You know that, right? Every time you read the Old Testament, God is preaching Jesus because he's preparing his people for the day that Jesus is going to come. Boaz is Jesus. Ruth comes to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, in, into that land and meets Jesus and takes everything she gets and go puts it back in Naomi's lap. Everything Naomi had came through a relationship that somebody else had with God. That's the reason why you have to have a relationship with God. You have to have a perpetual relationship with God because you don't know who's counting on it. And I don't know anything about Naomi. I have no idea where she came from, uh, you know, uh, what kind of situation she might have been dealing with, but you don't either with the people that you're around. And you don't know that, um, you know, you just think, oh, I'm just coming to church. I'm just coming to church. I'm just doing this. I'm doing. No, what you don't realize is you're taking what's here and you're putting it in the lap of somebody else that doesn't have the ability to have their own relationship with God in the way that you have it. It is important what you do. If you want to know more about that, then uh, ask uh, Vicki about it or, listen, uh, or just come to Wednesday night. She's been teaching on Ruth. The reason I know anything about Ruth is because uh, uh, Vic, she, uh, she made me do it. <laughs> Not really. She didn't, say, she didn't say read the book of Ruth. But if somebody's going to be teaching on something, I'm going to take my, I'm, I'm going to do, I mean, I'm going to do my part and I'm going to do my homework. They don't have to tell me to read the book of Ruth. I'm going to read it. And then if I find anything, I'm going to go give to her because she's going to communicate to you what she got. There's no need for me to say it when she can say it. As a matter of fact, there's a scripture about that. I forget exactly how it was. It might have been uh, First, Second Timothy or something like that. Those of you that are instructed in the word communicate to others that they might be able to teach others also. That's what I'm doing. As a matter of fact, we were having a discussion about this one part of it, and uh, she found some, and I found some uh, in the second chapter, and I'm not going to tell you what it is because she's, uh, but uh, it was just, it was fun just to sit there and have fellowship around the Word, just to talk about the Word. It was fun. I mean, it was just, it was good. I mean, you know, we, 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 we can talk about your bathtub. We can talk about, uh, you know, we can, we can talk about, uh, you know, how your plumbing broke in the house and uh, you know, how your car's tore up, I, I, fine, yeah, I mean, I, I'll listen, I don't want to hear it, because it, it starts making me think about the times in my house that, that my plumbing broke, and I don't want I, I don't want to think about that, but you start talking about the word, and man, I'm on it, and, I, and, and if you're talking about it, then I'm, not, I'm, I, I'm even better, because I don't have to come up with the answers, you got them all, <laughs> hallelujah. So anyway, Jesus is coming down. He says, uh, and the scribes and the chief priests, they heard it. They said they were, they were mad about that. You Listen, when you have success in your life, there's always going to be somebody going to be mad about it. Get away from those people. Just get that. That, is, that. that tells you, that lets you know. That lets you know right there. That's a sign. They're mad and jealous because you got something they don't have. You need to get away from that. Because what's going to end up happening is you're going to get around them and you're going to start to think like they think. You're going to start to act like they act. And you're going to think that God doesn't love you just like he don't love them. Which is not true that he doesn't love them. But they don't know it. They had not found God's love. You have. Relationship with God is important. They were mad. Why were they mad? Why were these people mad? And they saw how they might destroy him. For they feared him. Why did they fear him? Because all the people was astonished at his doctrine. <laughs> He's the man. He's not teaching a gospel. He is the gospel. He's teaching as one that has authority because he knows who he is. He's already whipped the devil in the wilderness. He, all authority was given to him then. You notice he never cast out any devil, not one devil until after the wilderness. Why? 
because he took on the prince of devils. He took on the prince of the power of the air. He took on the devil, Diablo, Diablos, for himself. Well, if I whoop the biggest bully in the schoolyard, guess who the man is? So Jesus is walking around in the schoolyard, and the bully's not the bully anymore. And all the little bullies know it. And I'm going to tell you something. When he was raised from the dead and seated, we are seated with him. Every single one of us. The devil don't want you to know that. Now, I'm not, going, I'm not telling you to go out there and pick a fight with the devil, but I'm telling you, if he picks one with you, if he picks one with you, you've got authority over him. And he doesn't want you to know that. And just because it doesn't look like he leaves right away, listen, when you use the name of Jesus, he has to leave right away. Just because you smell him, see him, that's just a residue. You ever run up on somebody who's got some strong perfume, cologne? I didn't say it smelled bad. You walk away, and you think they're still behind you. They're not. What was on them got off on you. Even though it smells like they're still there, they're not. Their presence is gone, but the stench remains. No, you use fragrance, Kathy, when you're talking about God. The same principle works with God, by the way. All right, let's just jump to verse 19. And when the evening was come, he went out of the city. And in the morning they passed, and they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. This thing is dried up from the roots. Now, it didn't dry up right away. It took a little bit, but it was dried up from the roots. As soon as he spoke that word, it was done. Nothing. Nobody said, hey, Jesus, look at this thing. It's dried up. It's, you know, he just said it. And I guess they thought maybe, you know, okay, well, I don't see any. I don't see anything that looks like it's dried up. But it dried up from the roots. Now, let me, let me just, and this is kind of where I'm going. I was going to go somewhere else, but this is what, changed this morning because I didn't know exactly which way it was going Jesus cursed the fig tree why in the whole text why wasn't it a sycamine tree why wasn't it an olive tree a pear tree orange tree well I don't think they have pears over there but anyway why was it a fig tree can anybody tell me the trees that were in the garden how many, first of all, how many trees were in the garden? Three trees in the garden. So you're going to hear something you never heard before. The first tree was what? The tree of life. Tree of life. You eat of this tree. You eat the tree of life, man, you just... Everything's good and fine and perfect. What was the second tree? Knowledge of good and evil. It was knowledge. What do men worship? Knowledge. What gets in the way of men drawing from the tree of life? Knowledge. Just ask anybody that thinks they're smart. They're so proud of how smart they are. I've got this PhD, I've got this DHD, I've got this. <laughs> but there was a third tree. There was a third tree. As a matter of fact, let's just go over to Genesis right quick.
let's see. Let's start reading because I didn't have time to prepare this. I didn't think I was going to go this way. Okay, all right, we'll start reading in chapter 3, verse 1, and then we'll, it should be in there and we'll find it. We're teaching without a net. How about that? <laughs> now, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. Now, the serpent, the serpent wasn't like a snake running around. The serpent was a, was a description of how the devil acted. You think Eve would have been dumb enough to sit down? Now, you mean if I eat this apple? I'll be like God. She wasn't talking. She was talking to a person, a being. So, certainly he was more subtle. He was, he was subtle. He was, oh, man. You ever run up on somebody that's subtle? They'll say things to you in a way. As a matter of fact, I can say the same thing to you, and it won't have the same effect. The reason is, is there's a spirit behind what they're saying. And you've got to recognize there's a real devil out there. So the, uh, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Yea, hath God said, Y'all shall not eat of the tree of the garden? He, the woman said unto him, to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is of the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it. Neither shall you touch it. Well, that was not exactly the, the rendering, but, you know, I, I mean, if that's her interpretation, fine. Somebody says she started lying to the devil. I don't know. I mean, you know, I mean, she, she was not an idiot. And the serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat, your eyes will be open. See, what, 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 are, what, what do people seek knowledge want? They want their eyes to be opened. And what does it say in the book of 1 Corinthians? They professing themselves to be wise become fools. Dylan McVaney, whatever his name is. Uh, Y'all know about that, right? Dylan McVaney, uh, never mind. I'm not going to bring it up because it's, it, it's, it, there's no need. If you don't know about it, just don't worry about it. It's just something going on in the world. It was just an example, but if y'all don't know the example, then I'm not going to say it. Ain't no, need, ain't no need putting that in your life. I ain't putting it in your life. You've got enough stuff to deal with. Okay, so, and the serpent said, well, you should not surely die, for God know that in the day you eat thereof, your eyes will be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for uh, food, I can't go through all, I can't tell you all the stuff. I mean, the, the same thing he said here. He said in 1 John, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. Uh, just jump on down to verse 70. The eyes of them, both of them were open. They knew they were naked. Now, I'm just thinking to myself, if I came to church naked this morning, Because ain't nobody want to see that. But I'm telling you, even if a little child comes running through here naked, that child, usually when a child runs around naked, he knows he's naked and he's free and he's wanting to show it off. His little fanny, her little fanny flapping in the wind. I'm free, I'm free. It ain't so cute when you get to be 50, 60, and 70 years old. My point is, is, they were, not, they, they, they were naked the whole time and didn't know it. And so here's the third tree. What did they sew together? They sewed the fig leaves together and made for themselves aprons. Now, what the fig tree represents is the things, this goes back to what Vicky's been teaching on uh, in Ruth. It represents, okay, you got the tree of life, you got the tree of knowledge, but there's this other tree called the fig tree, 
And that's what man does to hide himself from God. In other words, I am so insecure that I can't come to you the way that I am. I've got to cover what you already know, but I got to cover it anyway to make myself feel good. I've got to cover my nakedness. I can't come before you the way that I am. I can't come to you with my problems. I can't come to you with the things that I need answers to in prayer because I'm afraid if I let you know that, you're not going to love me anymore. So the fig tree represents that part of man that takes heed to the law and says, I have to obey this. I cannot let God see this. If God sees this, he will not love me. If God sees this, he will not favor me. If God sees this, he will not bless me. If God knows this about me, there's no way I would not bless me. If I knew somebody, why would God bless me? It's the things we hide. Now, there are things, don't come tell me all your stuff, okay? And don't go tell everybody else your stuff either. This not. It's not their business. But there is, you can always take your stuff to God. The blood has made a way. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He's the propitiation, the substitution of our sins. If we ask, he is faithful. Every time we ask, he is faithful to forgive us. Faithful, but not just faithful. He is faithful and just. But you don't understand, Andy. I actually did that. Yeah. And Jesus paid the price for it. And what you've got to do is you, he is absolutely just and justified to forgive you of your sin. Because he's already paid the price for it. It's like me buying Vicky a, a Mercedes Benz. Vicky, I need you to go pick that Mercedes Benz up. That's yours. You can have it. And, and it's already paid for. It's already done. And she goes up there and she tries to pay for it again. No, you go back to the one that paid the price. He's the only one that paid the price. It all goes back to Jesus. But the fig tree represented that thing that we try to hide from God because every one of us have stuff. It's different. It's messy. We don't want anybody to know about it. But I can tell you this, God already knows about it anyway. As a matter of fact, I was going, uh, as you get on down through here, he talks about forgiveness. I'm going to hurry up because of time. I'm going to get you out of here by 12. He's talking about when you stand, uh, when you stand, pray and forgive. Right. And one theologian said, forgiveness is that thing that you do to set a prisoner free. It's that one thing that you do to set a slave free only to find out that you were the prisoner and you were the slave. Amen. 